Great, so uh, a very warm uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, guests, friends, respondents, uh, uh, to the sessions on territory. Uh, this spring focusing on repair. Uh, this is a program uh, co-organized at the Department of Architecture uh, with uh, Nazli Tumerdam and Maria Maric, co-curated. Uh, thank you very much for, for this collaboration. Also, thank you, Kiana Zhu behind the camera, uh, Jan Zimmerman uh, with the online broadcasting, and Evelyn Gordon for organization. So a very, very special uh, session today with our speaker, Marietica Potrch, an architect and artist who will talk about the rights of nature. Uh, this will be followed by a debate or a discussion with Nitin Batla, uh, Laura Turley, Anna Pinehouse, and Santiago Del Hierro, uh, some of them joining also on Zoom, and they will be introduced in a moment. Uh, I'd like to tell you uh, just a few words uh, about the sessions on territory for those of you who are joining perhaps first time or who have not seen this format or who will look at it in the future online. We started uh, this uh, uh, program uh, or this series uh, around seven years ago already, uh, focusing on the urban, the future of the urban, or kind of redefining the idea of the urban in the sense of exploring what is the urban beyond the city uh, as the kind of first question where we debated the territory and the processes of change in the territory and, for instance, the notion of planetary urbanization. Also, the urban beyond the human, um, addressing the Anthropocene and our entanglements in the web of life. And finally, the urban beyond the object, where we discussed also the shifting contours of education and practice in architecture and urbanism. Uh, each iteration of the sessions explored the different and urgent perspective, as you can, uh, as you can see uh, uh, in, these, in these posters. Uh, so the, the sessions this spring are part of a project, The Great Repair, Politics of a Repair Society, uh, which is a collaboration between ARC Plus, the Academy of the Arts in Berlin, University of Luxembourg, and uh, our team here at the ETH. Uh, in February, we launched uh, the issue of ARC Plus here uh, in this auditorium, and we are working toward an exhibition in Berlin uh, at the Academy of the Arts in October. Uh, for the sessions this spring, we are uh, welcoming um, uh, five uh, uh, contributors to the Great Repair. There are many more, but in order to, to open up and uh, address together a few critical questions that are uh, part of this project. Uh, for example, what is the repair ethos and how is it being translated into practice? Uh, what does repair mean in the context of our material culture? Uh, can repair be positioned as a paradigmatic orientation in our field, alternative to the uh, growth-based and uh, technology-driven approaches to the built and the unbuilt uh, uh, world? Uh, also, how do we conceive the notion of self-repair in our discipline? Uh, uh, how are we repairing the construction industry, the architectural office, finally, uh, the curriculum, so the kind of, uh, uh, the, this kind of uh, uh, a crucial sites, let's say, of, of uh, production of space and production of knowledge in architecture. Uh, so, uh, in this uh, context, it is a huge pleasure to welcome Marietica Potrč, uh, a world-renowned artist and architect, currently based in Ljubljana, her multidisciplinary practice merges art, architecture, ecology, and anthropology. From 2011 to 2018, she was professor of social practice at the University of Fine Arts in Hamburg. Her work emphasizes individual and community empowerment, problem-solving tools and strategies for the future that transcend neoliberal agreement. The recent project, uh, at the 23rd Biennale of Sydney, uh, where she collaborated with 
uh, Virajuri elder Ray Woods focused on the rights of nature. Um, Marietica will talk indeed about the rights of nature, in particular two rivers, Socha in Slovenia and Lachlan River in Australia, which have been recognized by law as subjects or legal subjects or legal persons comparable to human beings. Marietica um, um, uh, will uh, present this work in the context of a shifting attitude toward nature in contemporary culture. So let's say a hypothesis of, uh, of a shift from society of owners to a society of caretakers. Um, looking very much forward to, to that debate. And after uh, Marietica's intervention, uh, we will have with us uh, uh, four uh, respondents. Um, uh, Laura Turley, uh, who uh, is a part of uh, Geneva Water Hub, uh, working at the Science Policy Interface. She is completing her PhD at the University of Geneva on water allocation and infrastructure. And previously, she worked as a policy advisor with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Uh, Laura is familiar with the, uh, 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 let's say, legal uh, problematic of uh, of the uh, recognizing the rights of nature. Then we will have with us on Zoom uh, Anna Weinhaus, uh, uh, who is a moral and political philosopher, currently holding a position of postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oslo. Her research focuses on themes in environmental ethics, such as biocentric perspectives on moral standing and concepts such as natural otherness and biodiversity. She is also interested in green political theory. Uh, further with us, uh, Nitin Batla, a lecturer and postdoctoral researcher, uh, uh, also coordinator of the doctoral program. Uh, you know Nitin very well, of course. Uh, his work uh, focuses on urban studies, political ecology and sociology. He lectures in these, in these fields. Uh, and finally, Santiago Del Hierro, also joining remotely. Uh, uh, Ecuadorian architect and urbanist, now a doctoral fellow at our chair with the research focusing on expanded representation of indigenous territory in the northern Andean Amazon, where he currently lives and conducts fieldwork and he will be joining on Zoom <laughs> after Marietica's presentation. So uh, thank you very much uh, for joining today, uh, Marietica. Uh, we are delighted to give you the floor and to hear you. Uh, we have also um, a similar audience in Zoom, uh, so let's see, we are, we are in this kind of a hybrid auditorium today. Thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'll talk about the personhood of nature. Maybe I should yeah, just change the slides here. So I'll talk about the personhood of nature, but maybe first I have to tell you how I got into all of this. Uh, two, two years ago, I was invited by Jose Roca, who was at the time artistic director of the Sydney Biennial. And uh, the Sydney Biennial, the um, uh, focused at the time on the state of rivers in late capitalism and environmental crisis. So I made a research-based project on the rights of rivers, and it turned out I worked on a river in Slovenia and a river in Australia. Uh, but for uh, when I thought about how to structure my talk, I decided to borrow uh, four drawings from Helio Milo, um, he's, uh, he was, he's not with us anymore. He was a rubber tapper and self-taught artist. And uh, we see him here. Um, he's on a journey to collect, uh, to thinking about how, where he will collect rubber at this particular day. And there are three stations. And for me, the three stations are Socha River, in, Socha River project in Slovenia, then Lachlan River project in Australia, and of course, a new knowledge production. Uh, we need to survive on planet Earth and its existential needs, so we do it. 
uh, as, uh, as uh, was mentioned before, uh, I believe that we are society of owners that transition to society of caretakers of nature. Uh, so I'll talk, I'll walk you through a few pathways for collecting the knowledge we need to achieve relationship uh, the personhood of nature, or to put it more simply, to regain and maintain our relationship with nature. Uh, something you might not think about, but I want to emphasize, is that one of the challenges we face on the path towards the legal personhood of nature is the emotional connection to nature as a living being. So that's, for me, it became a big thing. And just to remind you, it is still through human law that the rights of nature are determined and established today. Uh, but first, uh, I want to uh, want you to look at the garden that my friend Bruna cultivates in Ljubljana. It's an allotment garden, uh, and uh, she rents it from the municipality, and where she spends whatever time she has apart from her job and family obligations. There she saws uh, and seeds uh, and gathers vegetables and fruit, uh, makes compost, basically recycles everything, uh, she, uh, nearly everything that is in the garden. But she's also used to loose vegetables to snails and animals that feed on the roots. Uh, and now she encourages hedgehogs to make a home in her garden by making shelters from leftover branches, and somehow they manage the garden together. And sometimes she just rests and sits in the garden or just to be in the garden, just to be with nature. So what I'm describing here is, uh, is her messy collaboration with nature. So I repeat, it's a messy collaboration. You fail, you regain, uh, you know, uh, vegetables or, or like the, you regain your garden and then it falls apart again. again. Uh, the garden gives her a way to maintain her relationship with nature, which she sees as essential part of life. Uh, but this coexistence with nature she performs in her garden presents a major challenge for us as a society on a larger scale, on the scale of the planetary garden, if I can use uh, the expression by Gilles Clément, our planet Earth. So uh, again, a drawing of Helio Milo. We have a gardener and a garden working together. And you basically see two human beings. So one is a human being, the other is personification of nature. Uh, and they work together on their cutting a uh, wooden log. Uh, of course, they accept their mutual dependence on each other and take responsibility for their common project. And they work, when they work together, both the gardener and nature are living beings with their own rights, needs and desires, and their own agencies. So that's a, a new thing that we always now look when we talk about nature. Um, now to the tools. The tools for me are bottom-up and civil initiatives, collective actions, social movements. They are practices we society use, or if you want, we perform as rituals of transition from being owners to becoming caretakers of nature, which actually is a political and symbolic act. We will look at the struggles of three rivers in different parts of the world, Slovenia, Australia, and New Zealand, with each of these rivers, rivers for different reasons, civil initiatives developed around an issue that eventually built towards the personhood of nature. Uh, it is a call for a more egalitarian relationship between humans and nature. Uh, in the Socha River project, I will talk about a referendum for water, uh, which actually brought a transition from the rights to river to the rights of nature. In the Lachlan River project in Australia, I I'll present a caretaker on behalf of a river in the, who, who speaks uh, on behalf of a river in the human court. 
and uh, the Wanganui River in New Zealand where the rights of legal personhood were officially granted to the river, and probably you know about this, it's quite famous case. Uh, but also during this research and work I discovered, I just want to share with you a cluster of new keywords, which are, for instance, rights to water, the rights of nature, granting rights to nature, the personhood of nature, and the legal personhood of, of nature. And finally, and perhaps most fundamentally, we will point to an agreement with nature based on environmental justice, accepting the fact that nature is a subject with its own rights, just as humans are, and keeping in mind that Universal Declaration of Human Rights became a legal document only in 1948. Um, the Socha River, uh, for me, is the most beautiful river in Slovenia, uh, but it's also an endangered natural resource. It is in places affected by industrial pollution and the, in the political climate, there is a never ending pressure from the energy sector to build another dam on the river or as well as uh, pressure from environmentalists to remove existing dams. Uh, and uh, there is, uh, we just discussed a little bit uh, with, uh, before the lecture, the fact that uh, Slovenia uh, has this uh, nurtured this very uh, celebrated idea that uh, Slovenian identity is grounded in nature, in our mountains, forests, and rivers. Uh, so while rivers stand for the identity of Slovenians, if we put it this way, Slovenians in their turn speak for rivers, as was the case with referendum for water. Uh, when we were uh, preparing for a referendum on water, Andreas Lamaschek, a Slovenian advocate for river rights, told me, if there is no emotional connection, you can't give someone a relationship to nature, unquote. So our relationship to nature has to develop naturally. It is personal, like our relationship to our family or circle of friends. Her words stuck with me. They echo the importance of the emotional connection with nature that on another part of the world, Uncle Ray Woods, an elder of Viradjuri First Nation in Australia and caretaker of Lachlan River, uh, speaks about. So uh, he says again, I quote, a river is a living being like us. When we take from her, we also give back. It is like in a family, in the spirit of exchange we have with friends and family. It's never only taken from. So for Andrea and Ray, the emotional connection is fundamental to maintain the relationship with nature on which we depend for our survival on planet Earth. And of course, I'm reminded here also on emotional address uh, by Greta Thunberg uh, at the United Nations Climate Change Summit in, in 2019, where she talked very uh, uh, emotionally about uh, the species being extinct. extinct. Uh, so, in short, people who lack empathy for nature and view it as a collection of inanimate objects more easily consent to the premises of the capitalist state, which understands nature as a commodity to be bought, sold, and exploited for the benefit of only a few. Andrea says, when you don't have an emotional connection to nature, you can sell a river, unquote. So I know, for instance, on another side, activists who are buying land along a river where the dam is uh, supposed to be planned to prevent its construction. Uh, but the definition of the Anthropocene tells us that the human activities have changed life on Earth so much that we, together with the Earth, now find ourselves in a new geological era, the era of humans. In this era, we humans act as a force of nature. We are nature. Not so long ago, many of us operated with a seemingly comfortable distinction between humans and nature. We try to keep nature at a distance to shape and control it. For instance, the river is in a canal and not, it's not a meandering river. 
today, nature is getting closer and closer to us and more and more frequently comes, it comes impossibly close, as we know from our relationship with floods and droughts, but also in the realization that we are nature. So who am I then in this new intimate and sometimes unbearably close relationship with nature sitting at my family table? Who am I in the oneness with nature and the other way around? Who am I the social river in oneness with people as uh, there is this text on my drawing about social river? Um, so I want to also say, because I'm saying here oneness, this is not a romantic or, or new, new age term. The oneness I think about is a, a contested territory, uh, also, for instance, contested territory that we know each of us personally from living up in a family. Uh, so. Uh, now I'll walk you through the, uh, through the referendum on water rights in Slovenia. And I have to tell you, it's a little bit, uh, like I really have to go into 2016 when, uh, when uh, Slovenia amended its constitution to include access to drink drinkable water as a fundamental human right declaring that water resources are a public good managed by the state and not a market commodity. So basically, this idea of non-privatization of water came into the Constitution. Uh, Slovenia was the first uh, state in European Union to do so, and uh, this act was very much praised by, by the public, both in Slovenia and also elsewhere. But only five, five years later, in 2021, this right to water resource was uh, the, this right to water resource was threatened uh, because a law put forward by the government, uh, which was at the time right wing, and passed by the parliament without properly consulting the public, uh, would have changed water from a protected natural resource uh, to an endangered resource. So in June 2021, a civil society initiative called a referendum to revoke this law, which would have turned rivers and coastline into a market commodity, which was explicitly appointed in the constitution it shouldn't become. In a major win for this environmentalist movement, an overwhelming majority of uh, voted against the, the new law, uh, for instance, nine of ten uh, people uh, or voters supported water protection. Uh, this, for me, is a hopeful outcome because here you, we see that concern for the environment clearly outweighed any ideological uh, differences. But then this was also interesting during the preparation for a referendum. We asked ourselves what it would mean when people cast their vote against the law and for the protection of water. Would they realize that they were casting their vote for rivers in partnership with nature? Would they feel proud to be caretakers of water rights, sharing with nature the responsibility for clean water and the con con uh, conservation of rivers, sea and groundwater? Would they see themselves as guardians of river rights? So suddenly we are in this, like uh, a lot of questions, who am I, for instance, in this new relationship with nature? Uh, so uh, here are just a few words about a transition from object to subject, which we saw clearly uh, in the outcome of referendum. So the main decision you had to make when you cast your vote was whether you, a subject, viewed water as an object to be used or abused, as the property of humans, or instead viewed it is as a subject with which you share the planet. In the latter case, water, the liquid, becomes a body, like the drawing on the right side, like the bodies we inhabit. A river is a living being, which means it is no less concerned about its living conditions that we humans are about ours. A river feels it has desires and agency. For instance, it safeguards its body and environment 
for future generations. Of course, our life, uh, including humans. Uh, then transition from owners to caretakers. By voting for water, the majority of Slovenian voters declared themselves to be caretakers, not owners of nature. In the eyes of a caretaker, drinking water, groundwater, and rivers are a common good. It benefits human community and nature at the same time. The right to water then opened the way to rights of nature and, of course, a personhood of nature. Then, who am I here again? Another shift in thinking was the question I mentioned earlier. Who am I in this newly declared relationship with nature? We see in our communities an increasing awareness of environmental justice and the promise of environmental personhood as well, which is still very much a work in, pro in progress, of course. At the same time, when I ask the question, who am I in this new role, welcoming nature into my family, I know that indigenous peoples have been hosting nature at their tables from the beginning of time. Uh, indigenous people are not separated from nature, but we are those that separated ourselves from nature. Who then uh, is a river as a person? What does a river want? Can a river own, my, own itself? Can we own the river as a person? The answer to this last question is simple, we cannot. We are not the owners of our parents and friends. I cannot own my child, I can be his caretaker. Of course, the same goes for the rivers, I can only be the rivers caretaker. So uh, now I'll show you uh, four drawings uh, from the uh, visual essay, which I showed at the Sydney Biennial, which is called Rights of a River. And uh, we will walk through quotes which I saw on a poster calling for the referendum. The first one is, water is neither uh, left nor right. This is resolution number one. Uh, the referendum sought to reclaim Slovenia as a single territory that transcends ideological divides. This means the return of the community. So suddenly we had this return of the community instead of having two uh, very uh, like, uh, distinct and different political bodies. Uh, then the second uh, quote from the poster goes, water belongs to no one, it is everyone's. And here we have a return of the commons. Uh, the community, is united in the understanding that water is a common good and that when it is mismanaged, it becomes a common misfortune. So these, the, the commons come in. Uh, but also the referendum was an act of citizens' resistance against the intertwined interests of capital and the state. People were demanding environmental justice, the right of water, in the spirit of other contemporary struggles of uh, struggles for equality. More particularly, the referendum sought to reclaim territory as the commons. So Slovenia is a com commons territory. Uh, the underlying concept was to restore community through a reciprocal goods exchange, where goods are collectively deposited and equitably distributed. Dis dis distributed. For instance, we plant trees and forest gives us air to breathe. Uh, so basically this uh, reciprocal goods exchange is an ancient system of barter uh, exchange, but here it's this time it's a barter exchange with nature. The return of the future and the return of collective ownership. So I read again, uh, water is our right. It is our duty to safeguard water for future generations. So basically we are talking here about the return of the future. By means of referendum, Slovenia decoupled itself from extractive capitalism, which thinks only in short term, we voted for post ideological future and long term uh, changes. 
What the voters understood was precisely this, water is shared with other beings, animals and plants, soil and rocks, people and land. People then are caretakers of rivers and guardians of the river's rights. And uh, this is the return of collective ownership. But now I also want to uh, quote uh, Sinka Sivkovic, Vrbica, a Slovenian environmental lawyer. Uh, I heard her speak on an interview she had um, on live, on online during uh, the Crater project. It was last year. And she says, she talks about the relationship, uh, human relationship with nature, and she says, we must protect nature now when there is still time. Those who own land must become her caretakers and guardians. It makes no sense that people own small slices of the earth. Owners see their property to be used, abused, and exploited. Caretakers see the land as a living being. Just as in the past, the law granted human rights to humans, so now it, will, it must grant to nature the rights of nature. Um, so now I transition to the Lachlan River project in New South Wales in Australia, uh, where I collaborated with Ray Woods. Uh, he's an elder of the Wiradjuri First Nation, and uh, together with Wiradjuri people, uh, he is a caretaker of Lachlan River. Uh, we made a collaborative project to raise awareness about the dangers of the government's plan to enlarge the Viangala Dam situated in the middle of the river. And uh, the dam would have threatened life on the, lower of the, on the lower part of the river, lakes, wetlands, plants, animals, and people. Our collaborative work, which was part of a collective action, uh, played a role in the successful cancellation of the enlargement of the dam. So we both understood ourselves as being uh, somehow uh, talking uh, for the river, for the rights of the river, and against the enlargement of the dam. But I just also want to say a few words about uh, the Lachlan River ecology, which is very unique. It doesn't flow into the sea, but rather it ends in a wetland. And the river lives in cycles. They call the, the locals call it wet and dry world. Approximately every five years, uh, the river ceases to flow, and then drought and fires uh, follow. And every seven years, the river floods uh, the surrounding land and creates la lakes like the one you see here. Uh, the text on the right, uh, you see it's the first page <coughs> of the transcript of Ray's appearance before a committee of the Parliament of New South Wales, where he presented arguments against an the enlargement of Viandala Dam. And where I'm speaking all the time about this, where he speaks for the river. Uh, what stands out is the claim he makes in his second argument, the traditional owners, I quote, speak with a leg legitimate cultural authority for their nation, unquote. Here, the traditional owners are caretakers of the river. And I want to stress the importance of this shift in contemporary, contemporary culture in Slovenia, Australia, and all around the world, uh, where actually we are coming closer uh, to shift from owners to becoming caretakers. And it's somehow already embedded in the contemporary culture. Can I, a caretaker of a river, claim a cultural authority on the past to personify this, uh, the nature as a, as a personality. Uh, so uh, just at this point, I also want to point to a new alliance between indigenous knowledge uh, and uh, the, let's say, the stands or the standing uh, positions of environmentalists today, which I think is very important. But also on the other side, we also experience uh, the uh, rights uh, of, or, of uh, protection of nature to be exploited by, let's say, a right wing um, uh, advocates for protection of nature, then would also, for instance, in Germany was a case where uh, 
the forest would need to be protected, not to allow construction of a, a shelter for uh, migrants. Uh, so in here, uh, the trees tell us they are Thursday. We speak for them because the other living world does not have human language. In my drawing, which is titled The Life of the Lachlan River, which I also showed at the Biennale, the challenges and fears posed by the enlargement of the dam are told through the voices of the living world on the river, uh, including a black swan, a tree, the river itself, mother nature, the viragery people, and settlers. But here we see a tree. The tree says simply that it is Thursday. A red box tree can survive without water for up to seven years, but after that, it will die. So the, the drawing on the right, I quote from Ray Woods, who speaks for the thirsty tree, and as we saw before, in, to the parliament, and also at the same time to settlers. Uh, so I quote in his words, we are the people of the Vergeri First Nation. We are the people of the rivers. We look to see. We listen to hear. The thirsty country needs to drink. We hear her. The trees tell us they are thirsty. We hear them. We speak with, their, with other living beings because the other living world does not have human language. We are the caretakers of the country. Uh, here are a few more uh, quotes by Ray Woods that are similar to what environmentalists have been saying for some time now. I just, I think there are maybe eight of them. He talks on empathy with nature. I feel the trees. They are talking to me. They want to drink water. I feel it. They say we need to drink or we die on Mother Nature. Down here, we don't talk about irrigation. We talk about looking after mother. It is not about us. It is about the country. On building dams, those who built a dam on a river don't understand that the land is in common use. Nature and people work together. We depend on each other. On being connected. Everything is connected, rivers, insects, birds, the people we share with each other. On the time that lasts, whatever we do on Earth, we think of, of seven generations ahead. On the planet Earth, we care about Mother Nature, we support her, we respect nature, we protect nature. When we take, we give back. On trading with water, People who trade with water take, but they do not give back. And here he particularly, of course, addresses how this political arrangement or legal arrangement in Australia. Uh, then on taking care of nature. We who maintain nature, we understand her as a living being. We work with nature, we live with nature. A dam on a river tells that a river is slowly dying because the natural flow is taken away and the exchange with her environment is taken away. On the body, and this is a quote I particularly love, it's very telling. He says, rivers are like veins in your body, in your human body. Dams are like clocks in your blood vein. If you have a clock in your vein, you die. So he's talking about dams being the slow death of rivers. On trust and respect, we need to regain trust between people. We need to respect all of the living world. So he, all the time he was talking, we uh, talked many times on Zoom. Uh, it's interesting that we are here on Zoom again because I was not able to, uh, to fly to Australia. And what was really amazing is that uh, both of us uh, come from Slovenia and he's from New South Wales. Uh, from the Hay country, we, we talked, we had basically the uh, same uh, ethical and political stand. So it was like a, a super pleasure to communicate. There was no problem in miscommunication. And uh, it was a collaborative project, so that's maybe some other time. Uh, so we here come to Wanganui River in New Zealand. 
And uh, on the right, you see a page from the Constitution of Ecuador. And uh, in 2008, Ecuador became the first nation to grant rights to nature when it ratified several constitutional amendments. Here we see uh, new Article 71 to 74 that grant the environment the right to exist, persist, and be respected. And also, I would like to point to the role of the state uh, in these constitutional amendments, state as a mediator uh, that also encourages protections, protection of nature. So in a way, it's similar to what the Constitution of Slovenia uh, aimed to, to create a state which would be somehow mediator of these uh, well-wishing ideas of uh, the citizens of the state. Uh, so on, on the left, uh, the Wanganui River in New Zealand was granted uh, in 2017, was granted legal personhood. It is now a legal person. According to an agreement between Maori of the Wanganui River, who are the river's caretakers, and the government of New Zealand, the river is understood as a living being with rights of its own, which are equivalent to human rights. The agreement recognizes the enduring indigenous struggle by the Maori people to maintain control of their lands and rights and to represent the rights of nature and of, of a continual process to, de to decolonize both nature and people. After 140 years of negotiations with the government, they succeeded in convincing their fellow citizens that the river must be treated as a living being. And here I quote Gerard Albert, the lead nego negotiator for the, for the Maori in this discussion and this transition to Wanganui River to uh, a legal personhood. He says, we have fought to find an approximation in law so that all others can understand that from our perspective, treating the river as a legal, as a living entity is the correct way to approach it as an indivisible whole instead of the traditional, this is my translation, neoliberal model for the last 100 years of treating it from a perspective of ownership and management. And I will return to this idea, what is ownership, what does it mean? And what does co-owning means? So how does the Wanganui River represent itself and defend its rights into human courts? Uh, there are, if you don't know, there are two caretakers of the river, a Maori, a Maori and a representative by the state, uh, uh, they are appointed to act, act on behalf of Wanganui River. It's similar uh, to, as a caretaker, you take care of, let's say, of, a, of an orphan. Uh, granting legal personhood uh, to Wanganui River was a precedent that other countries have followed. In, in, for instance, in 2019, Bangladesh granted all its rivers the same rights as people. Now, the final drawing of Helio Melo, but not my final notes <laughs> yet. Um, so, um, like, uh, also, I also talk about my students and uh, uh, like the, this important idea that we have to produce new knowledge, which is not a standardized knowledge, it's not a modernist knowledge, it's not obje objective knowledge. And uh, how do we come here, uh, how do we come there to what we call the hybrid knowledge? For sure, not by sitting together with the usual crowd. We make it by making new alliances, such as between environmentalists and indigenous peoples and between uh, people and nature. The question is not how to do it. We actually know how to do it, but the question is how to do it together. New alliances where exchange, uh, when, when the knowledge is exchanged, make new methodologies. So I'll just uh, shift a little bit to uh, my and my students' experience in the Soviet project. 
where we articulated new methodologies by working closely with the local community that was not our culture. Most importantly and, uh, were, is, was the, peg, the fact that we were working and living in a black African community for two and a half months. Uh, so uh, the, when I'm talking about my st students, I have to explain that I was a professor of design for the Living World class uh, in the HFBK Hamburg. Uh, which was class of participatory practice, and we worked on long-term projects in local communities aiming to create school rooms for testing methods, methods of self-organization and solidarity. So from the beginning before, like years before we went to Soweto, my students understood participatory practice as a new practice that demands a new vocabulary. We were seeking uh, an operational knowledge that would stand apart from the standardized knowledge of the modernist discourse and be able to respond to the challenges of 21st century. This, uh, the, this new vocabulary began simply by not saying the, wor the word sustainability. Instead, we said resilience. Instead of saying unused space, we said available space. The focus of the class was always on people, not on objects or spatial designs. But it was during the Soweto project where uh, we work, where by working together, the students and the local residents transformed a derelict public space into a self-organized and maintained public space. So it was during the Soweto project that we articulated certain key methods, uh, which of course are, as I'm repeating now forever, not standardized knowledge. Uh, including, uh, the, we used uh, the words like relational methods, like relational objects, and performative action. Uh, for instance, uh, a, a performance platform, we built an organization of the Soveto Street Festival that we built together with the community. Then also a very important keyword is rituals of transition, placemaking, and naming. The methods we came up with during the Soveto project explicitly addressed demodernization and decolonization. But of course, at the time, we were not thinking about these big concepts, concepts of demodernization and uh, decolonization. We just realized it much later. So uh, just three years ago, uh, that's my last slide, when I uh, traveled in Australia, a friend alerted me to the book Decolonizing Methodologies by Linda Tuhiwai Smith, which, uh, who was a professor of indigenous education in New Zealand. And of course, also from uh, Maori uh, First Nation. I was surprised to read in this book a list of methods that were similar to what my students had developed in the Soveto project. Now, this is interesting. Indigenous Maori communities use these methods to shield or to protect themselves from the neoliberal social and economic agreement, as well as from the consequences of colonization. It struck me, med, uh, it struck me that the Maori and my students, using similar methods, found themselves together in the process of decolonization and demodernization, which I call a new partnership in knowledge exchange. Uh, on another side, also a new partnership in knowledge exchange is knowledge which is produced by indigenous and environmentalists when they actually try to merge together and uh, for this knowledge foregrounds values that address our relationship with nature. So it's not, uh, they are not against, uh, against like uh, this, against neoliberalism. They are uh, producing a new, uh, like new way of doing things, new focus. The modern era which we uh, associate with industrialization, uh, colonization and globalization suppressed indigenous populations and overlooked their knowledge. Uh, and now when, we, when now when the knowledge is needed, we lean towards it. And I was just reminded when I was putting together this talk about the term, which probably you know, it's gray literature. 
and uh, a project from several years ago which was launched by UNESCO was actually to look for uh, how to work with bees uh, which was different than the academic knowledge so uh, the knowledge which was contributed to this initiative included uh, like indigenous but also uh, people from let's say from the town of Zurich. So it was very much uh, opening the, the knowledge field uh, away or maybe moving it away from the, uh, from the academic position. Uh, so my students viewed the creation of hybrid knowledge as an existential exercise in the world in which they live. And here is a paradox. The modern era in which they were born, with its ideology of, ideology of progress, was trying to bring us closer to a better society, a better world, if you want. But this has, in fact, brought up closer to the extinction, the extinction of species and of nature. And since we are living in the Anthropocene age, we realize that we too can face extinction as we are nature. The Maori of the Wanganui River have a saying, I'm the river and the river is me. For them, granting rights to nature means a political rearrangement of values that parallels granting rights to indigenous people. So this is, of course, a call for social and environmental justice in the same breath. Um, maybe I just skip over some of this. Uh, like I was also trying to understand uh, basically a triangle between uh, the state, the society, and uh, capital. So if you think about the triangle and the state is here, uh, society is here, and on the top it's uh, a capital, then uh, now we are in this time when we are saying this uh, partnership between the state and the capital is passé. So instead of capital, on the top should be nature. So we are building this very precarious uh, partnership, the state and uh, not only the people, but the state and nature uh, are building this partnership now, which is very precarious and difficult to do. And of course, I'm reminded also about on European Green Deal, uh, nature restoration law and protected areas that it put forward. But uh, back to indigenous people, uh, they do not think of land as a property, neither private nor public. They understand that humans share land with nature and the idea that it's outside the Western tradition of property. I want to emphasize this. Do we, do we, do we stand for a new conception of, conception of ownership now? Does the legal arrangement of nature's representation in court make sense? The caretaker who stands for nature in the human court so others can hear her speak, as Ray would say, sees the limits of the legal personhood of nature. He says there is basically no need that we speak for each other. Everyone should listen and everyone should hear. Uh, a few words about uh, during the process uh, of making all this work, I got very much focused on constitutions. Uh, so basically egalitarian relationship with nature is proclaimed in number of constitutional actions that have taken place in many nations over the last decade. So the last decade became full of these constitutional changes in this direction. Some of them have acted to protect nature from exploitive capitalism, so against, let's say, neoliberal economic and social arrangement, like the Slovenian referendum, but also Maori when they uh, uh, granted, when, when they worked to, that, uh, that uh, Vanganui River was granted a legal personhood. But other constitutions, such as Ecuador's, have reclaimed nature as a Pachamama, mother nature, where the rights of nature are viewed as fundamental rights, aligned with human rights. The same is true of the first draft for upcoming, of upcoming changes to the Constitution of Chile. However, we have learned that this will be a very difficult process. 
so lastly, uh, I want to say something about the role of social movements uh, and are they guardians of the constitutions? Uh, so I want to say a few words about the role of civil society initiatives, uh, collective actions, and social movements, which play a central role in reimagining the world in line with the rights of nature. It is collective actions, the, let's say the agency of people, that move people to make the ritual of transition, again, it's a political and symbolic act. Uh, put, they put pressure on exploitive ca capitalism uh, that should trans and the transition the state uh, to the to be aligned with and uh, to get in partnership with the planet Earth. I see collective actions and social movements as the guardians of the new agreements that foreground the rights of nature in our constitutions. These actions, or I should maybe say better practices, are calling for a way to preserve and maintain our relationship with nature which they view as essential part of life, similar to how my friend Bruna views gardening in her allotment garden. So thank you. We will start uh, perhaps with, uh, uh, with the round uh, of um, um, let's say, questions or, or uh, observations or reflections from respondents. And uh, uh, let's see, just to, to kind of help uh, everybody maybe um, transition to the debate, I will just start with one kind of more personal question, if that's OK. So I was wondering uh, about that uh, uh, referendum in Slovenia and how uh, let's say extraordinary uh, that case is uh, considering, for example, that uh, we spoke about it yesterday, that in Switzerland at that same moment, basically in June 21, there was uh, this famous uh, pesticide uh, initiative and the Trinkwasser initiative, which, uh, uh, which basically failed on a public vote, so people in fact, did not support uh, um, 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 uh, let's say the measures that would uh, um, um, uh, prevent, uh, let's say, further uh, basically pollution uh, in in that uh, in that case. And uh, I was wondering. Uh, how, how do you how do you explain? I mean, you mentioned the identity. Is there perhaps a, a relationship also to uh, uh, to the to the socialist experience, to the Yugoslav experience, to the idea of self-management? Uh, I'm wondering whether whether that uh, that uh, played a role at any level. Um, I can say that, thank you, this is a super interesting question. So I can say that uh, the reaction for people to vote in such large numbers to protect water was based, actually, it was action against uh, the right-wing government that produced the law. Uh, and of course, they, then the people talked for, for, the, for nature in the referendum. Uh, and uh, regarding the self-management, we were part, uh, Milica and I were part of ex-Yugoslavia, and we discussed this very uh, difficult uh, transition that we, the, all the states of ex-Yugoslavia experienced by moving uh, from, let's say, a socialist uh, regime towards a neoliberal reality, and basically they dropped uh, uh, many of the, the gains that they uh, built up together during the socialist times. Uh, so, uh, actually, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, about this particular case, I, I never thought about it. 
but yes, it can be true that people thought in positive way about self-management. But it's not necessary because self-management was also some kind of a trauma for a lot of the states in ex-Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. So perhaps in this particular case, it helped to, it was a positive interpretation of self-management. So the power of people to, to cast their votes and to be heard. Uh, great. So I'm, uh, I'm wondering, uh, uh, perhaps, if it's okay, I'm, I'm seeing uh, Santiago right, right now up there on the screen. And since we, we had uh, uh, Santiago, do you hear us? Yes. <laughs> great. Well, uh, um, I'm wondering if you, if you want to jump in and, and maybe tell, uh, tell something about. Uh, uh, how do you how do you see uh, these proposals by Marietica from the perspective of your work and also you are you are Ecuadorian and of course you are familiar with that case of uh, of uh, of nature being enshrined in the Ecuadorian constitution. Uh, thank you, Milica, and uh, thank you, Marietica, for an, for a great presentation. Uh, many of the topics that you touched, uh, that you talked about, uh, are very close to, to to what I'm looking at and to how things are going on here in in, in Ecuador and in specifically in the Colombian Amazon where I am. Um, and one, I, I have uh, three things that come to my mind from your presentation that I, I would maybe li like to expand on, to ha to ask you for, for to expand. The first one is about. Uh, ownership this this movement this transition from ownership to caretaking i think this is something that we have been speaking a lot here with some indigenous leaders in the sense that ownership seems to still be the main way of protecting and uh, you protect what you own and therefore when indigenous people in this case the inga uh, own a, res a reservation a piece of land then they are entitled to protect it and the state recognizes that space of land, therefore indigenous people can protect it. But everything that is outside is not a responsibility of, there is no responsibility to protect. And that for me has been, is quite problematic because there are several, for example, there are several sites, rivers, sacred spaces, mountains that are very important for indigenous people that are outside of the boundaries of the spaces they quote unquote own through reservations. And so this, this transition of from ownership to caretaking moves us to the fact that maybe we can start taking care of the land that is owned by others. Mm -hmm. uh, how could, for example, we look at the ownership of land and how could the constitution through the rights of nature, for example, help indigenous people take care of a space they don't own? Um, and so this, this, uh, this, this has been quite a debate because in many cases, for example, sacred space, sacred places, uh, the only way to take care of them is if the owner, the colonist owner is sort of either kicked out or bought from. Um, and this brings me to the second point, which is that sometimes I feel when from abroad, when, especially when we're talking about indigenous people, we talk about them from a very, um, uh, a romantic perspective and and my experience here is very much uh, messy as you as you mentioned the, the messy dealing with with nature it's also it's a messy reality in which there's a there's a strong gradient between within indigenous people of how they see nature and there are strong debates on how much uh, western development can take can take place within indigenous uh, narratives uh, so I think sometimes this romanticization could be counterproductive because there's a constant feeling of treason, of when something doesn't go the way it should be within a nature or indigenous community, then, then there's been a, a betrayal of a discourse or a, or a narrative. And I think in that sense, uh, it, it is interesting, especially through also looking through Linda to Y. Smith's uh, book, uh, how can we sort of work with this gray zone within indigenous territories? 
which moves me to the third point, which I, I think you mentioned the word transition several times, and I, I completely agree that uh, the biggest challenge is not necessarily knowing where we want to be at or where we want to arrive or achieve, because I think many have that clear. We need to arrive to a world which is resilient and which already had, is out of, for example, resource extraction, uh, violent resource extraction. The, the thing is how to get there. What is the transition? Because in many cases, and this is co connecting to the 2008 constitution in Ecuador, the constitution is great, but 15 years later, we have seen in Ecuador that uh, changes has, change has been too slow and the constitution does not provide tools. People still, we still, the, the Ecuadorian economy still depends on oil extraction. And ironically, when the constitution was drafted, uh, it was done when the price of oil was extremely high. So we had this discourse in Ecuador of using oil or transitioning to clean energy. Uh, there's, a, there's a strong uh, irony in this. Uh, now that the, the, the oil prices went low in 2014 and 15, then, uh, then there was no uh, economy to transition to clean energy. So we're just stuck to extracting oil and using it for basic needs. So designing the transition more than designing the place we want to achieve or we want to arrive to is uh, very interesting in connection to the last slides you presented on, on hybrid knowledge, on figuring out how to get there more than figuring out where we want to be. Uh, so it's many topics that I think you, you made me think about and I'm very thankful of, um, of how, how you're portraying this and has, seeing how the Slovenian case, the Australian case and the New Zealand case are totally connected to what we're seeing here in Latin America. So thank, thank you for that. Thank you, like, uh, thank you so much, uh, Santiago. First of all, I, I just want to say something about uh, these, uh, the, well, I, I said before that the idea of property uh, is in the indigenous knowledge, not uh, like understood as public or private po property. So uh, are we then, are we, can we take care of other people's property? So basically we are ta talking about expanding ownership, not only within our communities, but also uh, what is very difficult between uh, people and nature. I think that uh, this co-ownership becomes very important. And uh, we who, are, uh, who have ever been point of uh, uh, community-based projects, we understand uh, the, that uh, co-owning uh, and caring of the common land works very well, uh, specifically on, on small scale, like community gardens are an uh, excellent example, but we, it becomes more difficult on a larger scale. And especially uh, the role of the state, it's a very contested. Uh, because it has been aligned for such a long time uh, with capital and now it needs to build a new relationship with nature. And that, as I said before, a European Green Deal uh, tries to, to work on that. Mm -hmm. um, but then also what I experienced in uh, my uh, like, uh, work with my students is that we urgently we need new knowledge. And uh, the new, new knowledge comes from the practices that are different from the usual practices. And you can build new knowledges only if you are working in these practices. So these sort of case studies become very important. This is why the Constitution of Ecuador is also uh, not only important, but super inspiring for uh, people who, who see their voice uh, going towards the the most important document of the state, which is the constitution. Uh, of course, it's a difficult transition. And uh, uh, I would say again that uh, new knowledge production is very important and it should basically, in my view, replace the standardized knowledge because if you uh, reuse the old methods, you are just uh, reproducing the, the old knowledge. Um, maybe that's... Good, maybe someone else has something to say? Uh, sure, I mean, uh, if I could invite you, uh, Laura, to, to join at this moment, uh, because um, um, 
I think perhaps related to this process of, of transition, right? So to, uh, you are uh, in the, you're coming from Geneva Water Hub, you are um, 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 in a UNESCO chair for hydropolitics. Uh, what kind of tools do we have or, or should we have, <laughs> let's say, in the, in the legal field or, or uh, governance tools that could, that could unlock this transition? What, what kind of debates are in your field? No, I was um, really pleased to hear about this series on repair and then particularly this session on repair of our relationship with nature and with water. Um, and I definitely commend the organizers for bringing in people like me from other fields because I think we always feel as well in sort of science and legal studies that we need mm -hmm. to be speaking with, you know, other people. So already just commending, um, commending you on, on that. And uh, yes, yeah, so indeed, it's, it's the Geneva Water Hub. We're a center of competence on water and peace located at the University of Geneva. And so I'm not a lawyer myself, but um, I'm a social scientist and we study the legal frameworks uh, over water resources. So water governance is a big and growing field of, of study, as you can imagine. Uh, and I think maybe my comment, which maybe seems a little banal, but just to confirm maybe the importance of this subject you've chosen from our field as well. It is significant and it is innovative and it does add a very important new tool to the toolbox of what's what's possible in water management. And that's for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, it represents quite a, a true break from the past. Um, water governance tends to be a field where um, for a number of reasons, we're really locked into certain ways of doing things. And a lot of that is because of the very large capital intensive infrastructure systems we have where once you've built a massive reservoir and all the distribution infrastructure to different users, that's really quite hard to change. <laughs> um, so, you know, politically, financially, et cetera. And then similarly, the policy and legal space doesn't move particularly fast or is not particularly prone to innovation for similar reasons. Um, people that have traditionally benefited from water allocation um, tend to have ways to kind of keep reinforcing that and growing their power and whether it's through agricultural lobbies, uh, we mm -hmm. spoke about a bit earlier, uh, mining, other, other words, uh, hydropower, uh, a lot of water users kind of really become quite entrenched with the rights. So this is just to say that um, it's not necessarily that this idea of rights for nature is new. We have some evidence of it maybe coming, well, we have article maybe from the 70s where they were proposing um, the rights for trees. Um, when there was, I think, Christopher Stone um, wrote an essay about rights to uh, trees defending themselves in a, in a court of law. Um, but it kind of fell on deaf ears at the time. And so why, since 2017, maybe a bit earlier, why is, why is it now picking up? Um, why are we now listening? Um, so I think that's maybe an intro, something we can also discuss together. Uh, I mean, from I think there's some low-hanging fruit there in terms of it being obviously the urgency is there to better protect ecosystems, the degradation of, of water, uh, water systems, um, climate change, and slowly seeing ourselves as part of, you know, nested in social ecological systems. Uh, slowly this change of mentality coming around and, and the need to restore uh, some sense of ecological justice. Um, it's also a new trend because it does represent a kind of a paradigm shift from very productionist, productivist, modernist views in water governance of using it again for inputs in all of our human ways um, to recognizing a more inherent uh, intrinsic value of water uh, and in stream flows. Um, and then, yeah, maybe to just say in terms of the legal frameworks, uh, indeed water, gov like water policy and governance is this usually a state human or state collective relationship, right? So the state in most countries owns water resources mm -hmm. and grants users rights to use that resource. And so rights are actually quite broad. They can they contain a number of things from full ownership and the ability to exclude others, to just having a use right, um, to other combinations of management and decision-making rights. Um, so we often call it a bundle of rights. In reality, it's not just one type of right, but uh, that's a human, that's a sort of a state human relationship. And um, 
and then indeed internationally it's a state state relationship but this idea of really the state to nature is is really is 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 new and is is a really important to take stock of and to take seriously and to and to develop um uh and then maybe yeah just to say another you know why is it significant in our field as well is because it's not just an isolated case you know for whatever reason all of a sudden this is really emerging in different parts of the world at more or less the same time which makes it um you know more of a, a global trend to 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 investigate uh so i could list examples i mean we've already discussed a lot of them but between the wanganui and new zealand um, granting national uh, legal personhood to rivers, um, to the, the Atrato River in Colombia, Lake Erie in the United States, um, following some pollution events. Uh, um, then indeed there have been indigenous councils and tribal councils that themselves have granted legal personhood to watercourses uh, in Canada, where I'm from, the Magpie River and the Klamath River as well um, from a tribal council in the United States. So, you know, maybe I'll just stop for now. I have some other comments, mm -hmm. but <laughs> just to say, you know, I think it's been, you know, a theme. It's, it's, it's innovation in a, in, in, in a field that isn't particularly prone to innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just uh, want to respond to these, the, the right for trees by Christopher Stone. Yeah. I know about the book, but I didn't see it yet in my library uh, but to speak a bit louder maria uh -huh. yeah. okay and to speak louder yeah. oh yeah uh, maybe uh, i think uh, anyway <clears throat> okay maybe it's uh, how, how does it sound maybe i lost okay. my speaker like i guess i oh, know here it is yeah sorry it's so tiny Mm -hmm. So anyway, now you hear me. So uh, uh, what actually, of course, first and very predictable reaction is that uh, the right for trees in 1970s was understood uh, as a sort of a new age idea. I'm just speculating you now. But now it's a different time. Uh, and just be, like between 1970s to now, uh, the public was really depoliticized. And uh, now the, the governments, they cannot uh, face these, the, the changes of uh, like uh, climate change and the decline of the social state. They cannot uh, repair everything themselves. They need more empowered uh, citizens. So uh, in, what I think is very important that these uh, new initiatives popped up. Evidently, people are empowered to stand for nature in some way. Maybe that's a simple question, answer. Um, maybe you would, um, it would be also nice to hear from Anna, our philosopher uh, uh, from Norway, now joining us remotely. <laughs> Anna, do you have also something to add or comment or ask to Marietica? Can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Yes, we hear you. Uh, yeah, Marietica, firstly, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Uh, I very much enjoyed listening to you, um, especially because all of those themes um, and topics uh, coming up in so many different disciplines, also my discipline. So it's always nice to see how those things are thought from a different perspective. Um, I can't uh, see you at, anymore at this point, just to let you know. So I'm just speaking into the void. Um, so I have a couple of questions that I would like to ask you because there are a lot of things I could talk about and we don't, <laughs> don't have the time, but I wanted to ask you firstly about uh, the idea of ownership again that Santiago already raised earlier, um, but a little bit from a different angle because I wanted to understand better um, how you see this issue. Because on the one side, at one point you were saying in your presentation that um, we, we, when we speak about a river, we cannot own this river. And you've, you're very right, I think, uh, with this perspective. But you also then again engage this idea of uh, collective ownership. Um, and also in terms of rivers, it's not that any one person owns the river, but we collectively, for instance, own it. 
And I was wondering how you bring those two themes together. Um, from my perspective, I would say that there are different perspectives in terms of the moral and the legal level going on there, maybe, um, in terms of that we might, morally speaking, never own the river. The river is something that, in essence, can't be owned. Um, it is not ours in a, in a moral sense, um, but we might collectively own it in a, in a legal sense, um, in a sense how our institutions consider it something that can't be owned by private capital, for instance. Um, as a second point, something that came to mind during your talk that um, I find quite interesting is that there's this uh, parallel development to the rights of nature that tries to do a very similar thing, because something about the rights of nature that it's trying to uh, do is take the system as we have it, which is not perfect, um, especially the legal system, which is based on ownership, which is based on individual rights and uh, property and so on. It comes from a specific cultural background and tries to address this globally and tries to fix the issues in it by trying to make it also more inclusive. So the rights of nature is a particular way of trying to address, for instance, indigenous world views within the legal system that we have. Um, and something that is parallel to that is this development of relational values that you also see in similar debates. Um, for instance, very prominent in the IPES, so the International Panel of um, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, in their recent value assessment, they were again, that came out, I think, just a couple of months ago. Um, they again kind of pressed this idea basically um, to. Um, to break up the dualism between um, this idea that a nature either only has instrumental value as something that can be used um, or something that can be owned in that context or something that just has intrinsic value or something that um, only matters in itself in the respectively of our relationship to it and something that these relational values are trying to address. And that, I think, came up a lot of the times when you spoke about rivers and how people relate to rivers is that they are not just valuable just out there or something to use, but they are particularly valuable to the cause of the relationship people have to, with it. And this relationship is valuable in itself. Um, and I was wondering how the rights of nature movement and um, this development about relational values, how they interact, um, because the, the, the aim is very similar in terms of to carve out something about how most people see the world that is not necessarily, hasn't been picked up in a lot of our common institutions or also in a lot of language that we have been using in, in, in moral contexts. Um, yeah, and maybe just as a last point, I was wondering how do you understand uh, personhood? So are, are, you, are you talking about this kind of legal idea of personhood or do you want to go broader? Because sometimes you speak about nature as a living being, so I guess you maybe have like an idea of Gaia in the background and I wanted to hear more about that. Thank you. So um, thank you for the questions. Um, I didn't hear uh, it's like voice in this hall. It was a little bit difficult for me this time. Uh, but I want to say um, something about uh, collective ownership, uh, because uh, we are talking about private and public, but now in the middle is this collective ownership, which includes the idea of co-owning. And we know it very well that it can be uh, like operational as we know it from collective housing, for instance, here in Zurich, I think it's, I don't know, one fourth of population lives in collective housing, if I'm- Co Cooperative. In cooperative, sorry, uh, collective housing, sorry, my English. Uh, so um, it's, uh, it's just like, as I said before, it's easier to uh, imagine this collective ownership on a smaller scale. And now when we are bridging uh, to uh, this, the relationship uh, with a different relationship with nature, where actually nature is sitting uh, at our family table, and family table, as we know, is also contested territory. We are trying to, to build a relationship with nature, and we know we can do it. 
Uh, so again, this I, I, I think I see like three steps. One is uh, me, myself, changing the relationship with nature. Then I work uh, in, in uh, community, let's say community-based projects, or I uh, take my vote to a referendum to be part of a larger uh, movement, social movement, uh, towards the change of relationship with nature, but uh, actually at the end it's very interesting this, the, the role of the state uh, because uh, we trust the state to mediate uh, like what we citizens uh, wish and desire. No? It's very sort of symbolic, symbolic wish to, to so maybe uh, someone else can uh, yeah. say something. I mean, uh... Yeah, I mean, I'm. I'm. Um, uh, I think it's uh, it's an interesting debate. Perhaps I would I would return it to you, Anna. This this relationship between uh, in, intrinsic values and uh, uh, relational values, and perhaps you could shed light uh, a little bit on on that, um, um, because this. Uh, uh, um, yeah, this this is a it's a changing field, right? And uh, and uh, you know what what is what is the state of the art right now in the in the discussion? Well, um, the concept of relation values is interesting insofar as uh, philosophers didn't come up with it. It came out of interdisciplinary contexts where a lot of social scientists who were both uh, working on questions about conservation um, were were proposing, well, there's something missing about how we speak about value in normal senses, because when we look at data and we speak to people and have interviews and so on, then the way they speak about value doesn't fit into the generic categories we usually use about value. When people speak about their garden, for instance, or when they speak about um, the landscape around the place they live, they usually use terms that indicate a specific relationship to the place that is important to them. They don't just say um, this river, for instance, is important because I take water from it. So it's not just instrumental for use, but it's important because if this specific river is important to me. It's different than all other rivers because this is the home I've been living and where I grew up to. It has a specific significance to me. And um, so this kind of ideas doesn't fit very well with this idea of intrinsic value, which most of my field for the last 50 years has been focusing on, this idea about how nature or natural entities matter in themselves without them being important for humans at all. So this idea that um, non-human beings or nature as such, ecosystems, species and so on, have value and moral standing that goes beyond our gaze on them but that they matter in themselves, and that obviously then provides us reasons for, for protecting them. But then the point with relational values was, well, stop, you know, there seems to be something missing to the story that other reasons we have, besides of that something is important in terms of its instrumental value or in, in terms of its intrinsic value, is also that it's valuable for our relationship in terms of how we relate to it, to it. And this is also something that needs to be recognized and taken seriously. And this is interesting that it's now also visible on the international level, like in institutions like IPES, that they're trying to take this up to exactly try to do something similar, like the rights of nature, be more inclusive in terms of worldviews, because in essence, the instrumental intrinsic values ideas are uh, as standard ideas from a Western analytical, um, moral philosophical viewpoint, where there's nothing wrong with it per se, but this, this is not all, every, everything that can be said about philosophy and doesn't include all uh, traditions and um, ontologies about the world. And um, this relation of value ideas tries to pick that up. And now the last few years, now, moral philosophers has, have come in and tried to figure out what do we mean by relational values, and that is then another big debate. Great. I think this this is, uh, um, of course, in the um, in design, in planning. Of course, these uh, these questions come up because we also ask ourselves, okay, you know. Ultimately, are there, you know, what, what is the meaning of, of, of property? What is the meaning of, of um, 
uh, uh, let's say, various uh, relationships that we, that we establish. But uh, uh, I, I would like to perhaps uh, make a little uh, uh, shift at this point to, uh, to the question of, uh, of knowledge and methodology that you mentioned uh, um, uh, and you, you elaborated also in your, uh, in your talk. So there was the example of Sovieto, there was the example of methodologies that you developed there, there was the example of um, uh, uh, the book "Decolonizing Methodologies," where you where you said there is a there is a link between, uh, let's say, what you develop with your students and uh, and the kind of uh, indigenous uh, uh, methods in their territory. And uh, uh, I, I thought we should just spend a little bit of time on this topic. You know, you 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 mentioned this knowledge, uh, notion of uh, hybrid knowledge, right? We don't need the standardized knowledge anymore. We, we need a, a new kind of hybrid knowledge, which is somehow co-produced, right? With, yes. with yeah. nature, but also, let's say, with, with other, uh, um, um, let's say, other knowledge producers or other, other cultures and so from other sort of perspectives. So, so how, how do you see that? And then maybe on that, I would like to bring also Nitin and then maybe once again, Santiago and other people from the audience um, uh, can we make that shift, let's say, in, in academia, <laughs> in, a, in a, let's say, institution that produces knowledge? Um, per, would you like to start to clarify a little bit what, was, mm -hmm. what were these, these methods that you worked on in Sovieto and then we could... Um, yeah, uh, thank you, but uh, Anna also thanks a lot for uh, like your input. It was... Uh, everything is so interesting for me, so I'm really uh, very thankful for this uh, discussion. And yes, I can tell a few words about uh, the new methodologies we made in Soviet-o project with students. But of course, we didn't know when we went, uh, and also when we were in soviet that we are producing new methodologies. But after uh, we departed from there, we said we have to name them because we saw evidently that we, that the methodologies we used were different from like a designed uh, public space in, in, this, uh, in this case. For instance, mm -hmm. uh, the ritual of transition became very important. Uh, the participatory practice has four steps. I can say a first step is uh, before starting uh, a participatory project with a local community, you need to get informed. Then the second step is uh, to work on the concept or on the vision of the vision of the project mm -hmm. uh, together with the local community. Then you have to do it together. You cannot do it for them. You have to do it together. So. The fourth step is actually the most important, where uh, you, uh, as a co-initiator, let's say, of a certain project, you can step out and the community takes over. So in this case, they become owner owners of the project. So the success is that you can actually go away. And uh, a new, uh, a new, basically, a new uh, way of doing is happening without you being there. So that's an uh, important shift in this larger transition that we uh, are experiencing. So for instance, I'll explain to you, the ritual of transition for the Soweto project happened on a Saturday morning uh, from 8 in the morning to 12 noon, we cleaned the park which was full of garbage together with residents. And uh, when we did this, we understood that now we are uh, like, we are transitioning from just talking to actually doing. And from that moment, uh, this ritual of transition really uh, showed us that the project is taken on. And uh, we know ritual of transition from our lives, like when you get married, you have a, a ritual of transition, you invite your friends and it's a big party. Also when someone dies, you have a ritual of transition to a new existence. 
Uh, but as an architect, because I'm also a trained architect, we never could use a ritual of transition in my own discourse where I studied at a very good but modernist, very modernist uh, school of architecture in Ljubljana. Uh, so that's an, that's a, that's a, uh, uh, an example, but also to name. You have to name when you see that you're doing things differently. You have to name them because otherwise they just flow away. You have to reclaim the knowledge. And we found out quite late in the process that, that a lot of our methodologies were somehow similar to urban anthropologists, you know? But we never thought about it when we were doing it. When, or so. Maybe that's a... Um, thanks also from my side for the beautiful presentation. I would like to go back to Slovenia um, uh, and this idea you started with this kind of uh, Slovene identity that uh, Slovenes are people who are connected to their nature, the mountains, the waters, the forest, etc., which may be in a way also quite similar to Swiss. but. Uh, I mean, you said we have to produce this new knowledge, um, but I remember from one of our meetings with Arch Plus, uh, you were mentioning this um, uh, Stara Vera, uh, this old uh, religion. Um, and so I was thinking, are you also maybe talking about uh, remembering this ancient knowledge? Uh, mm. Is this also uh, uh, mm. some? Um, is this also one part? Uh, so this is one question. I have another one. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's about this water diplomacy, which also um, is uh, what Laura is uh, an expert on, uh, and this idea of ownership. Uh, you were talking about these dams and how also in Slovenia, environmentalists are also kind of uh, trying to uh, un unbuild, I mean, these dams, whereas, uh, these energy companies are trying to build. And I was thinking about this uh, because I know it personally, I guess, uh, southeastern uh, Turkey, these uh, Euphrat and Tigris rivers that have been in that uh, region uh, and flourishing the region since uh, time immemorial, let's say. And there is this kind of uh, uncoordinated uh, water development projects uh, which literally become this hydropower, so they are used as leverage, these dams to kind of, they can cut because these rivers are flowing in three different states, Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. So, I mean, how does it work when it's this between different states, uh, these core riparian states that, I mean, you can have this uh, guardianship and you actually uh, look out for, you know, the good because it's ownership then, who owns? I mean, Socha is also, it starts uh, the sources from Slovenia, then it flows into uh, Adriatic in Italy. So uh, how to do that, uh, handle that, and, or repair that diplomacy between states? Yeah. This, this, should, this second part goes to Laura, <laughs> for sure. And a question about the old fate, maybe. Uh, yeah, that, that's a super interesting. Thank you for bringing this up. So Jose, when I was doing the research about uh, River rights in Slovenia. There is a book that became uh, very uh, sort of like not popular, but a lot of people know about it. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, diaries of an ethnologist who was walking in the valley of the Socha River and documenting practices and uh, of the old how do you say nature believers in nature or something. I don't know if it, this is worship the, of nature. Uh, uh, they were basically it's the same. It's very similar to indigenous understanding of nature. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was like a super fantastic to read these stories in this very big book, like really detailing the um, the interviews with uh, people from this uh, nature religion. Uh, uh, how they, basically when I was a teenager they were there but we were not aware of them 
<laughs> so we would, for instance, I would travel to India or places like this to experience a different mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, uh, it's amazing that they are documenting. So it's very important to understand that we are on our territories in Europe. Mm -hmm. We all have a, a previous uh, relationship with nature, which is very similar to indigenous mm -hmm. understanding of nature. So it's not something completely new, or it's not something romantic or esoteric. It's very, uh, they, of course, they were also persecuted by uh, Catholicism. A lot of people were also killed if they would know uh, that you were part of this uh, understanding of the world in a different way. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's uh, it's good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I really enjoyed the presentation. Thanks a lot for that. Um, and I was um, just gleaning on the collective knowledge at our schools of landscape and urban studies in the Gete, um, where so many of our doctoral students are working on water mm -hmm. and on uh, the more than human sort of socialization of water um, and many of them are here uh, Johanna um, and uh, Tatiana and uh, Sara Frikic and so many so many of our PhD students and uh, also the MAS students who have been learning through a lot uh, while discussing their texts um, and one of the things that keeps coming up is um, um, and I just wanted to perhaps illustrate that through a very clear sketch that you make. And I loved your detail to um, drawing as a methodology in your entire presentation and in the larger body of your work, which is uh, the, the category of human itself, like um, um, that uh, you, you had it very clear, subject, object, human, non-human, like non-vital human rather. Um, and then subject, subject. And I was wondering, um, the category of human has never been so natural, right? Like, I mean, um, the entire sort of bind that we are in today is because we don't consider some people human, um, even now, like, um, and um, so many immigrants sort of try to use these waters to come into Europe to flee all kinds of precarious conditions. And uh, when we reflect about rights of nature, we don't think about um, these non-humans or the people we sort of banish as non-humans. Um, so I was wondering if, if perhaps there's a third sketch needed there to, to also qualify um, the difference in, in human as well as a category. And um, the other thing was, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just sort of like drawing upon uh, what Santiago said about property and uh, perhaps what implicitly, Lisa, you said as well, uh, about uncertainty, which is um, many of these um, sort of, uh, because I mean, uh, several several of our, um, several of the researchers in, in our community here have been looking at uh, sort of correction of rivers and sort of uh, certainties around river and um, what's agrarian land. Uh, in which uh, certain prop property re regimes have been sort of materialized through internal colonization uh, of Switzerland, um, in which um, um, so uh, in which like people who have been unpropertied have sort of always tried to work around uh, regimes of uncertainty. So using the uncertainty of water and land to to perhaps do agriculture in, in the time in the dry season or uh, to use the floodplain for some other kind of thing. So uh, I, was, I was wondering, like, um, because we always cast um, our lens of modernity versus indigenous so far away, like, are there like places closer home as well through vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, which we can sort of think about uh, perhaps um, uh, sort of complicating this uh, personhood of nature, uh, firstly, and, um, and the, the things that it sort of like intersects with, um, which in, in our ambition, as, as I'm gathering from your last slide, which is on decolonial methodologies, perhaps there are ways of being decolonial through reflecting on things closer home than 
indigenous ontologies, which is quite easy to sort of fall back on because it's so further away. So I don't know if, if that makes sense as a question at all, but... Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, like I, I also don't know if my answer will make sense. <laughs> but, uh, so for instance, uh, I remember that from speaking with uh, uh, Ray Woods, uh, he constantly was talking about care, trust and respect. And he was uh, saying this not only to care for nature, but also to care for the other in, in our human society. So, uh, which reminded me on uh, the agency of my students who always said, we have to regain uh, um, collective decision making. We have to uh, understand again and to use again collective decision making. So by basically to reclaim uh, that individual is not only a self-centered individual, but uh, collectively conscious individual. And this is now just extended to nature. Uh, so while we are this remaking, like mm -hmm. in our society also, when I think about uh, how, like I, I was in Germany when all of these immigrants uh, came and they were so uh, like, um, accepted with open arms. Uh, I, I was also a part of this uh, being there. So th this attempt to, to speak with others and to do something together. Um, what was the, the last, sorry, the last thing you talked about? It was a rant, but <laughs> <What>? <laughs> it was just a rant, but uh, maybe I could try to frame it in terms of question. Um, which is around, um, I mean, because we, we think of always property versus commons, mm -hmm. but uh, when we think of property versus commons through uncertainty, which uh, the ontology of a river mm -hmm. as a non-vital human uh, always reveals to us that uh, we never know when the dry season <laughs> would strike or when it would be floods. We, yeah. we can only say so much about it and how the unpropertied have always sort of, you know, relied upon those uncertainties to create something that's not commons, but it's not also yeah. property. So perhaps like how, how does um, the, the constitutional um, rights that are very much around property and commons yeah. uh, um, think about uncertainty as well? Yeah, the commons actually are not, we cannot reclaim the commons before uh, they were, uh, put outside by the change of law in, I think in the, I don't know, was it in 18th century? So we cannot go back to the understanding of the commons. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. But it's evidently, uh, the commons are coming back, but in a different uh, dress, if I can say so, in a different mm -hmm. uh, understanding. Mm -hmm. So I'm also trying to figure mm -hmm. out, uh, it's always a danger when you talk about the commons, people want to shift back to this understanding of the commons mm -hmm. uh, before industrialization, okay, mm -hmm. the industrialization. Mm -hmm terminated the commons in uh, UK, mm -hmm. which was the most famous uh, case. Uh, uh, but for me, it's very interesting that I'm talking a lot about indigenous people and then also understanding that in my own country, there was some kind of indigenous reality when I was a teenager. So basically this is uh, like a, a hope to connect over generations, but also uh, to be able to think of, of a better future for us, which would align with nature, I believe, and less with the politics. But at the same time, we, we talked about importance of the state and also the de delegation we have to in the state, in the pro political process. So I think that it's important to work on, let's say, political actions, but also on, on symbolic uh, uh, projects. Mm -hmm. uh, I always considered, uh, sorry to just raise again, the, the, these community gardens, they are so small, so marginal, but they are very good practice when you get together to try to listen uh, to each other and also to actually frame your relationship, not only with your neighbors, uh, your community, but also with the city and of course with the future uh, 
community you want to live with. So I think these the processes that are uh, like uh, hands-on, grounded uh, on the on the planet in our realities are very important. Um, so uh, uh, we are almost almost uh, out of uh, out of time, but I'd love to give a, a, a word to to the audience. Um, we have uh, a few uh, river river experts, <laughs> as you announced, Santiago. Um, Ah, Boston, 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 Okay, do, uh, Boston, would you like to? Hello. <laughs> uh, hi, Boston. Hello. Can you hear us? Hi. Yes, yes, I hear you perfectly well. Uh, it was really uh, inspiring. Uh, and Maria Pizza, thank you for this amazing talk, as always, you know. You are quite an inspiration, I think, for all of us, not only Slovenia, but I would say from everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. um, I would just, if I may, I would just uh, share with you some of my uh, thoughts. I don't know if I have a concrete question, but I will try to be very, very fast. First of all, I would like to um, bring out one thing which a bit bothered me, and um, the, 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 the thing is about the that we need to be very careful um, within, when we talk about the vocabulary, own vocabulary. So when we talk about the newcomers, uh, it's important that we don't define them like immigrants and so on, because, you know, uh, in the time of uh, non-aligned Yugoslavia, actually, people um, were bringing knowledge and solution for the, let's say, for the areas which are now forced to come back on the Balkan route. And we all know how um, the state is actually um, taking, how the state is uh, taking actually uh, in consideration uh, these these flows. Uh, so this is very important. That and there was one there was one thing which I think is very important uh, um, mentioned that the role of the state. I think it's quite questionable, especially you know. Um, uh, Nasle was talking about was talking about the border area, and I think the border area in each border area is not only the border area. Uh, I would say um, territorial between two different uh, uh, countries, because if we are in Europe, we try to kind of skip this idea of the border, but. For example, living in the territory between Slovenia and Italy, you know, um, this border is very fragile. Uh, since 2007, actually, all the corridor from the northern part to the uh, southern part of the Slovenia, Italy, is actually not populated or overpopulated, and uh, there is no kind of um, it's not built, it, so it stays in a way as a corridor of nature between these two, let's say, European countries. What is the problem? That there is no communication between these two countries. So, you know, there is a border which is actually working, I mean, it's functioning perfectly uh, uh, in a way well. But if you want to come, for example, from Trieste to Koper, which is 15 kilometers away, there is uh, no communication between this, these two cities. So, um, the 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 question is also, for example, uh, the question of, of uh, for example, the northern part, there is a small village, uh, Topolo, um, where, where a young, uh, let's say, collective started kind of in a devastated or empty village, started a project uh, where they follow, in a way, the idea of bell hooks, but also if you want to uh, compare it with Kyong Park's idea of the city in a village, which is actually a very, very interesting way to uh, create uh, this kind of new, um, let's say, um, relationship between, uh, between the village, between the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, as uh, what I wanted to stress, you know, it's that uh, I was, uh, would say I was uh, after 20, uh, 20 years of working in within or for the state or in the academia, in a way, decided to, to take a more objective position 
in this subject, as Santiago, for example, said before the beginning, um, that it's very important to connect different uh, 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 different uh, contexts. Uh, but for that, we really need to uh, react fast. Um, and yeah, we don't have time. You know, I, I, I we had um, so. We don't have time, for example, I live also between Copper and Berlin, and for example, in Berlin it looks like it's 2023, but in Copper it looks like it's 1974. So there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, sexism, nationalism, misogynia, homophobia, and naturally, as, as so, such, it's not treated as an important subject. So, you know, all these things are like coming before uh, of, of, of nature and of this understanding how important it is today for us to survive, to understand how to how to change and switch the the, the, the uh, position towards the nature. So for me, uh, a comment, you know, I, I now I'm, I'm collaborating with an open source, independent open source already for for so this is like for 13 years, and uh, uh, what I realize is important that these discussions just don't stay only among us. So it's really important to use this kind of possibilities of technologies. So to uh, bring out these different narratives, not only to uh, the same practices, but also to people. Uh, I don't know, we have like over 1 million followers and we actually really try to make this kind of diverse, uh, diverse, uh, um, to bring up diverse uh, context, diverse ideas, diverse uh, views. And uh, I must say that uh, like the experience in this, if I compare experience in academia or experience in this online, online opportunity, it's like a very important thing to, um, until we still have this possibility, you know, to, to use the online opportunity to, to, to communicate with it, uh, that we can really share much faster uh, uh, and uh, all the, the ideas, not only int intuitionally as we normally like work. And this is, I think, um, this is like maybe one of the, one of, of my proposals, like to really, um, this is an amazing, amazing uh, talk and an amazing discourse that we have now here. But please, you know, uh, I would really like to connect and, and share and would do anything to bring this discourse uh, live within this community. Uh, and uh, maybe if I still have 30 seconds, may I? Maybe 10. <laughs> I will just show, I will just uh, read something what Pyong Park said at our hackathon, which we had parallel in Frankfurt and Skopje. And um, what we did actually with the architecture, we uh, succeed to bring Mostar Bogdanovic uh, partisan monument into the healing process. So within this community. And Kyung Park was last uh, the, the main talk, uh, speak, uh, the main his note speaker on the hackathon. and. Um, he quoted actually Tenzin Dori, where he said, the world is short of love. We must raise the production of love so that it can live more harmoniously. How can we increase the production of love and distribute it, it wide and equally throughout the world? Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Bustan. Uh, regarding, uh, Bustan was mentioning the relationship between Slovenia and Italy at the border of it and uh, perhaps the governments are not communicating i'm not following politics so much but i know of uh, special uh, alignments between different activists and project makers in italy and in uh, slovenia who work together towards a common issue uh, also Bushan mentioned the village of topolo which is a very interesting Case study, it's located in Italy, but it is, uh, uh, it, uh, it's a proposition uh, to understand the village as a house, basically, you know, as a family house. So this idea of family, which I also was talking about before, 
Uh, and uh, so th they say the village, which is just has 20 or 25 inhabitants now, it's an old, beautiful village in the mountains. They say, okay, the living room is a uh, open space and uh, the bathroom is this house and uh, uh, other sleeping room is another house. Mm -hmm. So suddenly it's, it's a very old architectural uh, idea but it caught uh, it caught it caught people's imagination and they received a new Euro new european bauhaus award for it mm -hmm. uh, for thinking about how we live in the communities in a different way maybe that's my short answer to your long question <laughs> uh, okay great so let's uh, let's take uh, Johanna, you're, you're there. If there are any other questions, that would be then the last uh, round. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much also for the nice lecture. I have a quite short question. Um, I'm, I'm working on the Rhine, and uh, in this context, I look a lot at the work of Dilip Dakuna. I mean, he, he writes a lot on, uh, also on the Indian context, but he brings, uh, so when he talks about rivers, he brings in the notion of wetness. Uh, and also tries to completely uh, question the concept of the river as essentially something that is constructed by humans, as something that is somehow uh, only exists once we draw it on a map and once we define the boundaries of a river and once we um, decide to focus uh, on the hydrological cycle uh, in the moment of flow and not of evaporation and, and so on and of rain. And I'm wondering, so also I, I'm constantly thinking about these questions of like, do we need a different word to describe what we're seeing? And like, how do we define the boundaries between land and water? And is talking about the river as an object, like, or can we, do we have to talk about something else? So I wonder what you, what you think about that. And if you have, do, do we need a different way to describe this being or this entity that 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 we talk that we call river uh, um maybe you can help me with answer but i think uh like, like i'm not sure if i uh, got the complete essence of your questions a question but uh, i think it's uh uh the, actually it's it's interesting to think about the river as an object because you can sell it and as we know, it's a practice uh, in the world today that, for instance, you you buy an uh, a, an island, or maybe you can buy a lake and a river as well, no? Mm -hmm. uh, and extract from it. So then there are more uh, extractivist owners, and then more sharing owners, and so on. So uh, the the living uh, the river is a living being uh, is is actually it's completely a new concept for our society. But as I wanted to talk before, it is a very living and uh, practice in the indigenous communities. And uh, in caretakers like uh, Ray Woods, uh, it's, he's very clear about this when you read his uh, like appearance in the uh, New South Wales Parliament, when he talks about the rivers, he talks clearly about what is a, a living being, a river as a living being. If you want to, I can share the document with you. So is, maybe I missed some? Or, um, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm also not, I, I think it's, uh, it's this sort of a more, uh, more uh, broader understanding of, of a kind of hydrological cycle, right? So that, that yeah. the river is, is sort of one, one kind of, perhaps yeah. you could say, materialization of, uh, of uh, you know, of the world of water, right? Yeah. Where, which, which, uh, which uh, you know, surrounds yeah. us or percolates through, through the yeah. kind of entire environment, including our own bodies and so on. So, so why is river something different, right? So this kind of a very holistic uh, picture, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, so, um, uh, what is your answer? <laughs> uh, well, I don't, I don't have an answer, but I think it's, for me, it just opens up to think about it in a different way. So for me, 
the, this notion of wetness opened up to think about, uh, you know, uh, trying to understand where the boundaries were drawn at a certain moment, and that maybe, especially in the context of, of climate change and flood control, these boundaries are, are also constantly reconsidered. And, and now we are also in, in this context in Europe, a question to to look again at the maps and look again of where, where we drew once the boundaries and we, we see the conflicts that this created. And I think in that sense, uh, the river is is not that defined maybe anymore, even in a non-monsoon based mm -hmm. environment. And for me, this was quite an interesting observation, mm -hmm. but I, I don't have an answer to Absolutely. this. It's also interesting, you know, like what Ray Woods is also saying that uh, the river is not only the river, it's alive, uh, around the river. So it's uh, not only in the river, but around the river. So you, as a person who lives by the river, you're also part of the ecosystem of the river. Um, there was something else I wanted to say. Um, <laughs> it just I, have, I have something which is the very last thing for, for, for the event, because I'm just simply dying to, to ask you this. Uh, so it concerns your wall drawings, right? So this, uh, uh, you have been drawing for many years, right? And mm -hmm. then I, I, some shows I have seen, there were, there were kind of smaller images, right? And you were, you were documenting these, these processes of social um, participatory processes, social actions, these, uh, these, these ritualistic actions that you created and so on. And you documented somehow these learnings, right? And you, so you have been somehow sharpening this or, or developing this, this form of expression for a very long time, no? Mm -hmm. and, and now there are these magnificent drawings of rivers, right? That, that, uh, could you say something about that? Because I, I feel, and you mentioned also that this kind of symbolic moment is very important. How do we communicate uh, these, mm. these sort of insights or knowledge? And so, so I'm just curious, mm -hmm. how did you arrive to these drawings? And um, yeah. yeah, thank you. But uh, first I have to respond to you because then I realized that actually it's uh, interesting to say that the, like we, technically talk about flat plains when we talk about rivers. But when you listen to Ray Woods, he talks about floods as something very essential and normal. And this is, we have, we have like in this the project of the great repair, there is also to think differently about something which is considered dangerous as flooding. Uh, so I, I just thought this was, uh, he, he had an interview with, uh, for, a, uh, for a radio in Australia and they sent me the video. So anyway, the drawings, I have two practices now for maybe 20 years. One is to make what I call visual essays. You have seen some of the uh, drawings from visual essays about Lachlan and Socha River. And uh, they are basically a picture book. They tell a story about something that I think is, uh, I can share with people because you don't make art just for yourself. You, you want to share it with others. As a writer, you don't put the manuscript in your uh, drawer, you, you publish a book. And uh, the, the diagrams that you refer to that are uh, becoming wall drawings, I work on these for many years, but maybe I don't advertise it so much, but they have been shown everywhere. Uh, and uh, what we do is actually we, uh, like the, the diagrams are like mind maps, but as you have seen, you have seen one of them, this Lachlan River drawing where you see a man, which is a tree, which is actually a lake and a river, which has these roots, like uh, Milica showed it before I started to talk. Uh, it's very important for me, like you have been to probably Documenta 15, and you have seen tons of mind maps, and then you just get lost and you get tired. So I wa always want to introduce an image that leads you into the, let's say, political or ethical question. So I'm always very particular. There is this 
uh, what symbolic image that actually uh, allows you to enter uh, the ethical or political topic? Um, well, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I think it, uh, it, uh, I, I feel like uh, you, you have left, left us with this mind map because mm -hmm. there were, you know, we went along all these different branches and, and opened all the different questions that, you know, we, we uh, yeah, we have to continue to work on. That's all I can say. So thank you so much for that. I, I really admire your clarity, you know. This is something that, that really stays with me from your work, right? So mm -hmm. thank you for that. No, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, friends on Zoom. Uh, Anna, Santiago, thank you, Borstian, uh, everyone in the audience, thank you, everyone in the honor. Um, great pleasure to have you with us. <laughs> thank you. See you on the 22nd for the last, for the last session uh, about self-repair of a broken discipline uh, with Charlotte Malterbart, uh, uh, Maria Cohen, and Mio Tsuneyama. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.